far away at a minute. And if you could change your name when you get a second to put the um, number, your presentation number yeah. first, then you kind of come yeah. up. Um, uh, does that work? That looks great. Yep. Okay. And then um, just change my name, right? Okay. Yeah, so you're number eight. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started in the interest of time as we're trying to fit a lot in in this new format than where things might go wrong. Uh, so good morning and maybe even good afternoon to some of you. Uh, welcome to the first locomotion podium session at our uh, ASB virtual conference. I am Jessica Allen, an assistant professor at West Virginia University, and I'm joined by my co-moderator Zan Cox from UC Irvine and Hannah Carey, also from West Virginia University. Since this is all new to us before I, uh, we begin, I do wanna give you a little bit of information on how this session will be run. Uh, it will consist of 12 talks that are gonna be broken up into three half hour blocks. Within each block, there will be four lightning talks, each of which will be five minutes. And then there will be an eight minute or so question and answer period following those four talks. Due to our time content constraints and to accommodate as many questions as possible, we do ask that uh, one, you make sure you are logged in using your real name. And that two, you type your, any questions that you have in the chat box. We will be monitoring the chat window and uh, pulling questions from the chat window during the Q&A that come through either during a talk or during the Q&A portion. Please do note that this session is being recorded because we're going to post it on the conference site shortly after it is completed. And then finally, we invite you all to participate in a continued discussion of these presentations in our dedicated Slack discussion channel that's associated with this specific podium session. Uh, the direct link to this uh, Slack channel will be posted several times in the chat window throughout our session for easy access. And then we also invite you to have follow up face to face discussions with each other in the virtual ASB lounges on spatial chat uh, if, it, if you find that of interest. All right, so let's go ahead and begin. Our first speaker is going to be Matthew Solzano from Penn State, uh, talking to us about moment arms and their response to loading history during growth. Hi, today I'd like to talk to you about our study in which we investigated moment arm plasticity in response to loading history during growth. So moment arms are one of the fundamental elements of the musculoskeletal system that help determine locomotor function. They affect the moments produced around joints as well as muscle dynamics through force and length velocity effects. However, despite the known plasticity to alter loading of other elements of the musculoskeletal system, such as muscle, bone, and tendon, it's currently unknown how or even if moment arms also respond to changes in loading. So here to investigate moment arm plasticity, 
Christy, we used an avian bipedal model during their growth phase. We split the birds into three groups in order to obtain a spectrum of load level. We had an exercise group that was allowed to freely roam around a large pen and also had multiple perches for them to jump to. A sedentary group was housed in a small pen with a low netting to restrict movement and discourage jumping. Finally, we had a Botox group housed in a similar pen to the sedentary group. They also received bilateral injections of Botox every five weeks into both gastrocnemius muscles in order to induce further restricted movement. The protocol lasted from when the birds were four weeks old until they were six months old, at which point they had reached skeletal maturity. At the measure moment arm, we utilized the tendon travel protocol using dissected limbs and motion capture. So the Achilles tendon was attached to a linear transducer to measure tendon excursion, while tarsum metatarsus was moved so as to rotate the ankle through roughly 60 degrees of motion. Now from the motion capture data, we were able to calculate joint angles, which were then paired with the excursion data, and that allowed us to calculate moment arms. Uh, we then ran a mixed effects model uh, in order to determine the effect of group and uh, on moment arm and any uh, interaction between group and angle. Now we ran the model twice, first time with angle as a continuous variable, which allowed for comparison of moment arm versus joint angle relationships between groups. Uh, and the second time we ran with angle as a categorical variable, which allowed for mean comparisons at three specified angles. Now this slide shows the results of treating angle as a continuous variable. The line graph shows average moment arm for each group over the measured angle range. Uh, with the shaded region showing plus or minus one standard deviation. Uh, we have exercise in red, sedentary in blue, and Botox in green. Now, despite the overlapping standard deviation, there was a significant group by angle effect as well as a significant group effect. Uh, the, exercise control, the exercise group appears to have a consistently larger moment arm than the other two groups, while the sedentary group appears to have a different slope compared to the other two groups. Now, this is a little tough to see with all three lines, uh, but if we isolate two at a time, it becomes much more apparent. Uh, so we're going to step through them. This is for visualization only. So exercise and sedentary here, we see that the exercise group has what appears to be a slightly larger moment arm throughout the range of motion. Uh, we can also see that these slopes uh, between the two groups are different as well. Here we have exercise and Botox. Uh, again, exercise appears to have a larger moment arm, uh, but the slopes between the two groups are pretty similar. And here we have sedentary and Botox. Um, the uh, magnitude of the moment arm appears pretty similar throughout the range of motion, uh, but the slopes between the two groups appears to be different as well. All right, so now the box plots here show the results of treating angle as a categorical variable, which again allows for mean comparisons at our specified angles. And those we chose were 30 degrees, 60 degrees, and 90 degrees, as that just covers our full range of motion that we tested. Uh, we can see that at each angle, uh, there does not appear to be a difference between uh, the three groups and their means. Uh, and we found no group by angle interaction effect either. So statistically, our results are pretty ambiguous. Um, depending on how we classify angle in our model, we get differing results. Treating it as a categorical variable showed no difference in means uh, at the three specified angles. But if we treat angle as a continuous variable, we saw a differing slope in the sedentary group compared to the other three group, or the two groups, uh, and also appears that the exercise group may have a larger moment arm compared to the other two groups as well. Um, but because of these ambiguities, we are hesitant to decisively conclude that moment arms are plastic, but we'd rather say that our data suggests that it's possible and more work needs to be done. A uh, limitation of our study is that our treatment may not have induced large enough difference uh, in loading across all three groups with our sample size. In the future studies, some of which we started already, will implement a larger sample size and stronger loading signal. Um, with that, I'd like to thank everyone who helped with the study. And at this point, I'll take any questions. All right, thank you, Matt. So remember everyone that uh, all questions will be asked in the Q&A uh, or in the chat box and we'll get to those during the Q&A portion. So we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next talk who is Jeffrey uh, Olberding from UC Irvine who's going to be talking to us about reconstructing contractile dynamics from muscle length change. So uh, good, perfect. <laughs> 
so in this work, my co-authors and I are interested in the feasibility of the approach of using muscle length change that you measure in vivo to recreate uh, contractile dynamics in isolated muscle preps. So as comparative biomechanists and muscle physiologists, we want to understand how muscles work in a lot of different animals and a lot of different mus mus musculoskeletal systems, but it can be hard to know in vivo muscle length change and forces simultaneously. We're pretty good at measuring length changes, but our techniques for measuring muscle forces are limited. They can be imprecise and certainly they can't be applied broadly to all the different systems we're interested in. Uh, one alternative approach pioneered by Bob Josephson at UC Irvine is the well-known work loop technique uh, where we try to model in vivo length changes and apply them to an isolated muscle prep. And this works pretty well for things like steady state uh, flapping flight in insect flight muscles, but it fails to capture the complexity of other types of locomotion. And so I assume this video on the right side of the screen isn't playing, but this is a recording of a guinea fowl running over uneven terrain. You can see that length profile in blue plotted beneath the video. It's not a steady uh, pattern. It's not a simple sine wave. There's variation being introduced by complexity in the substrate as this animal's running. So what we want to do is use a, a intermediate approach between these two where we take those in vivo length changes and apply them to an isolated muscle prep. But before we can do that, we have to understand if the forces a muscle experiences when it's contracting against a reproduced strain profile are similar to those produced when it's contracting against dynamic external loads, or in other words, is a length-driven contraction the same as a force-driven contraction? So to start approaching those questions, we're using what we're calling a hybrid in vitro, in vitro in silico muscle prep, where we have an isolated muscle, in this case from a bullfrog, that's being stimulated to contract against our muscle lever. The forces measured from that muscle are output to an external controller. In this case, it contains a dynamic model of a simple single joint uh, jumping organism uh, from a previous publication. And then the forces interacting with that model result in an appropriate length change for the muscle that's fed back out to the lever. So in effect, it's as though this muscle is contracting inside uh, this simple organism to cause a jump. So we're calling those types of contractions force-driven because length change is resulting from muscle forces interacting with an inertial load. But what we can do is take the length profile that results and reapply it to the same muscle uh, at a later time. And we're calling those length driven contractions. So we can do this on the same muscle and ask whether or not we can create the same pattern of, of force and length change. And uh, not to hold you into suspense, but there are no differences. I'm showing you uh, length and force through time and the resulting half work loops for two different bullfrog muscle contractions. And you can see there's virtually no difference between the force-driven contractions and the length-driven contractions in red. Uh, and in hindsight, that makes a lot of sense because from the muscle's perspective, all it's experiencing is a change in length being actuated by the muscle lever. It doesn't matter whether that length change is being calculated in real time or whether that was already predetermined. But the reason we were able to get this really tight matching between the two types of contraction is because we have ideal conditions. We have the same muscle in the same setup with the same pH and temperature and starting length. We're controlling stimulus conditions. We're accounting for fatigue. So what we can do is start to poke at these different conditions to ask how sensitive is the ability to match force and length during contractions to these different factors. Or in other words, we can start to understand what else do you need to know from your in vivo measurements besides the length change in order to uh, reproduce the dynamics in an isolated muscle prep. And here's some preliminary data where we started to probe that looking at mus initial muscle length. Um, but of course, the answer to that question is going to depend on what muscle you're looking at and what, what particular movement you're looking at. So the real power of this hybrid approach is that we can plug any muscle we want into this setup and we can program any dynamic model that we might be interested in. So we can look at all sorts of different types of movement. And we're excited to start moving forward with those questions once we can get back into the lab. Uh, so with that, I'll just thank Liz, Tyler, and Isha for help with the muscle preps. And I'll be happy to address questions when we get to the Q&A portion.
Great. Thank you everyone so far for staying on time. So our next speaker is Emily Abbott from Georgia Tech, who will be talking to us about mechanical sensation by muscle spindles during active muscle tendon work loops. Everyone good? Can you see it? You're good. Okay, thanks. Um, hi, I'm Emily. I'm a postdoc at Temple University, but today I'll be talking about work I did with Tim Cope and Greg Sawicki at Georgia Tech. Um, we all know that most animals move to survive and during locomotion, limbs flex and extend rhythmically as the muscle tendon units are physically active. These muscles have complex architectures like elasticity and pinnation, and that means that the muscle fascicle lengths are decoupled from the muscle tendon lengths. In other words, a muscle fascicle can be shortening while a muscle tendon is lengthening, and the, this decoupling allows muscles to store and release elastic energy. Um, but muscles and tendons aren't just the motors that move our bodies, they're also sensors, and we know that sensory feedback is important because conditions that impair it, like through experiments, aging, and disease, uh, there's a, they also present functional decline in balance and locomotion. So given that muscles are both important as motors and sensors, I ask, how does muscle structure and function affect mechanosensation, specifically mechanosensation of muscle spindles? Um, muscle spindles send action potentials or spikes along sensory nerves, the spinal cord, and we can identify when these spikes occur and calculate the firing rates of these spikes. And a lot of the knowledge we have about, about these muscle spindles comes from passive paradigm. Our muscle tendon is stretched and shortened, and we see that the firing rates increase with stretch uh, and don't do much during the shortening periods. Um, however, we know that locomotion is active and that the fascicle lengths uh, don't, aren't necessarily depicted by muscle tendon lengths. And so to really bridge this gap, we look at mechanosensation uh, in a locomotive context. We could combine classic work loops with electrophysiology. So with rats under anesthesia, we isolated the medial gastrocnemius. We attached the Achilles tendon to a servo motor and clamp that femur. The servo motor applies length changes and we measure force from the servo motor and at the same time we're measuring length of the fascicles with sonomicrometry. We performed a laminectomy to isolate, to expose the spinal cord and we grabbed our dorsal and ventral roots of interest on these bipolar uh, electrodes. Uh, we place a very fine microelectrode into the dorsal root to measure the firing rate of a muscle spindle. This is a passive condition and the active condition uh, we apply the same length changes uh, with the same period, and we but we stimulate the ventral root, uh, and in this phase, uh, and this is at voltages below gamma drive thresholds. So there's no gamma drive, and it's for 25% of the the cycle where we get this very classic decoupling of the muscle fascicle lengths from the muscle tendon lengths. Um, and if we look closer at these time series, we see that in the passive conditions that the muscle spindle is firing with both, when both length and force are increasing and the peak firing rate is occurring before the peaks of the length and force. And we can plot this in a work loop paradigm with force on the y-axis and length on the x-axis. And in red is what the muscle fascicle is doing and in black is what the muscle tendon is doing. Um, and we can see that in the passive conditions, they both are stretched and force increases, and when they shorten, force decreases. And we can plot the uh, spindle firing on here, and we see that it's firing mostly during these periods of stretch. Um, in comparison, in the active condition, the muscle is stimulated, it produces force, the fascicle shortens and stores energy in the tendon, and then when the um, muscle is deactivating, the tendon releases that energy and the fascicle is stretched. And we see that firing only occurs during this stretch period of the fascicle. When we plot that on a work loop, we see again the fascicle is shortening when it force is increasing while the muscle tendon unit is lengthening when force increases. And plotting the firing rates of the muscle spindle onto here, we see that it fires again only when the fascicle is lengthening. And what I've shown you today is a repeated measures comparison of the same muscle spindle in different conditions. In the passive condition, the muscle spindle fired uh, when both length and force were increasing. In the active condition, it uh, fired only when the fascicle was stretched, but force is decreasing. And interestingly, we also see that firing rate is higher in the active condition and that this uh, length when the firing uh, begins onset, the threshold is different in the passive versus the active conditions. And so altogether, we see that the pure output of a muscle spindle um, doesn't give us information about all periods of this work loop, um, but that 
and this just highlights the need for modulation uh, like through gamma drive or integration of other sensors at the level of the spinal cord. Um, but in, the main takeaway is that these data suggest that muscle spindles aren't these simple one-to-one uh, -one sensors where there's some threshold and some gain, but they really need to be looked at in a locomotive context like work loops. Um, thanks for your attention. All right, thank you, Emily. We're going to um, stay with our muscle cool dynamics and actually also uh, locomotion and move on to uh, Sam Kwok from Georgia Tech, who will be talking about muscle fascicle dynamics during the collisional phase of walking and the relation to push off phase. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, thank you very much. So when humans are walking, we know that humans have an innate ability to adjust their gait in a way that minimizes metabolic costs. This can happen as fast as in within two and a half seconds, which is too fast to be attributed to direct metabolic sensors. So there must be some sort of indirect ways to sense this. One possible explanation is uh, we can look at this through dynamic walking principles. Now in dynamic walking, as energy is lost during the collisional phase, there's negative work experienced by uh, the leading limb and this should relate to muscle tendon unit lengthening on that leading limb, which may act as a local estimate of this energy loss. So if negative work were to increase, there should also be an associated MTU lengthening. And dynamic walking principles would suggest that in response to this, there would be an increase in the push-off force to reduce that negative work. Now here, many MTUs may be working in conjunction um, and may all be lengthening at the same time in this leading limb, but for the purposes of this experiment, we're focusing only on the tibialis or the TA muscle as a representative candidate of um, energy loss because of its characteristics as a muscle that crosses over a single joint that resides very close to this collision site. Now, if, though muscle tendon units may experience lengthening, that doesn't necessarily mean that the muscles themselves are lengthening. So in addressing this question of whether muscles can sense energy loss through this negative work done by the leading limb, I hypothesize that during this collisional phase that the muscles of the TA do in fact change in length during this time, as well as the muscle force changing, and that when this occurs, that it'll result in a change in the subsequent ipsilateral propulsive force. Now I'm looking at the subsequent ipsilateral force rather than the concurrent contralateral force that happens at the same step-to-step -step transition because of this previously mentioned two and a half second latency that needs to be made for the proper adjustments as well as the reflex latency required for changes made in the TA during this energy loss period. Now to test this hypothesis, I recruited 11 subjects and had them walking under five conditions, where I changed the subject's step frequency while maintaining a constant walking speed, as well as changing walking speed. Now to analyze this, we looked at the ipsilateral breaking phase and compared it to the subsequent ipsil ipsilateral push-off impulse. Now within this breaking phase, we looked at the breaking impulse, TA fascicle length changes through ultrasound, as well as peak TA tendon force. In the interest of time, we're only going to be looking at the results for the step frequency changes, as the results in the speed changes yielded very similar results. Now if you look at the violin plot to the right, um, what we're showing here is that each individual colored dot is a single step from a single subject and the white dots in the center of the plots are the mean of all of the steps within the condition. So then within the condition, it represents about 70 steps across five subjects. Now, literature would suggest that the, during this breaking phase that TA fascicles act isometrically during this breaking period as suggested by this grayed out area. But as you can see, some of our conditions do agree with this conclusion, but you can also see that this may be an overgeneralization of what's actually happening as we see a very high amount of variability in the fascicle behavior, even seeing shortening while this muscle tendon unit would normally be lengthening during this breaking phase. Now this suggests that if the fascicle length feedback were used as an estimate of negative work, that these estimates would likely be just as variable and possibly too erratic to be reliable for this measure. Now if we were we to look at this exact same data on the x-axis and compare it to the, su the subsequent push-off impulse on the y-axis, and then over here, as you see, as you're going from left to right, we're decreasing the step frequency, which would also increase negative work. You see that there's a lot more spread in the data as you increase negative work, along with a very low R squared value across all the conditions, which shows that the 
TA fascicle length changes are an unreliable predictor of the subsequent push off impulse. Now, in contrast, if we were to look at this behavior compared to the TA tendon force, you see that there's a much stronger relationship with a lot higher R squared values relative to the changes in fascicle length. And as you can see, the, or as you may not see, um, what we've shown is that these relationships um, are very closely resembling the rela expected relationship we see when we compare breaking to push off impulse. Now this trend suggests that as you experience a higher peak TA tendon force, um, this correlates with a greater push off. So then you would expect a greater push off impulse on the next step. And it's also significant to see that 45% of the variability in this relationship is explained by a single muscle tendon unit, as I expect there to be multiple, multiple working in conjunction to make these estimates of negative work, which would suggest that if we're looking at multiple muscle tendon units, that this variability would probably increase in terms of what we can um, attribute to um, the correlation to push off impulse. So as we have seen, though muscle TA fascicles behave relatively isometrically on average, there is a high degree of step to step variability that may make them an unreliable source of feedback. As well, a single muscle, the tibialis anterior, is able to account for almost half of the variance seen when comparing breaking tendon force to the subsequent push off impulse, with the rest of the variance at least partially taken up by mus other muscle tendon units. Thus, it seems that feedback from the TA tendon force rather than fascicle length would be a good candidate to rapidly predict energy loss. Um, I would like to thank uh, the Comparative Neuromechanics Lab in uh, Georgia Tech as well as NIH for funding this study. And just thank you all for listening as well. Thank you so much. In the interest of time, I'm going to get started right into the questions. And like I said, this is for all four. So um, all the presenters, please be aware and um, potentially unmute yourselves when necessary. First one is for Matt from Jason Franz. He asks, um, the tendon excursion method assumes a constant tendon tension throughout the range of motion. Um, to what extent does this assumption hold true in your experimental paradigm? Uh, so our linear transducer had a 10 Newton tensile force on it. So it was able to keep that constant tension on the tendon the whole time during the protocol. So I think that kind of controls for that variable. Okay. Um, oh, other quick question for Matt. How do the moment arm angles that you measured relate to different um, functional tasks? Uh, so the angle range we used, we tried to capture the stance phase in running for guinea fowl. Um, unfortunately, we wanted to get jumping, but it was a little bit of an odor slight on us, but at least we got the stance phase in, jump, in running. Okay. Next one's for Emily from Adrian Adreas. Um, how did you stimulate the ventral root and were you able to super maximally stimulate the muscle? Oh, that's a really great question. So we removed the dura mater on the spinal cord and then we kind of fish out the ventral root from underneath the spinal cord. And then we don't cut it at all. We just keep it on top of a bipolar electrode under some tension and we stimulate it electrically with that bipolar electrode. We never did su uh, super maximal yeah, super maximal voltages. Um, those voltages uh, often cause a lot of issues. Um, even though it's in like a mineral oil bath, it, it caused some issues with um, feedback and bleed through and the electrical signal. So that, that we've, all, we've only been able to do submaximal contractions. Um, how about for Jeff um, from Harold Panasso? Um, have you looked at contractile history effects like residual force enhancement? Uh, Good question. We have not yet. Uh, like I said, the model we're using right now is a very simple uh, jumper model, and we specifically preclude the ability of any sort of counter movement. But there's nothing stopping us from uh, coding something like that into the dynamic model and exploring how that impacts uh, the ability to replicate those types of uh, contractions. So I hope we can do that in the future. Great. And one last one um, for Sam from Jason Franz again. Um, have you considered instead imaging the uniarticular quadriceps as a surrogate for energy assumption during the collision? Uh, thank you, Jason. That's a very good question. Um, we did consider a lot of muscles. I think just for the sake of convenience, we just concentrated on the TA muscle. But I think in the future, we'd really want to look at a lot of muscles at the same time to really get a very holistic understanding of what's really happening here. So I think that's a, likely going to be a future direction of this project. <laughs> 
Great. Well, thank you. That's the most time we have for questions right now, and we're going to move on to the next session. Um, and the first speaker is Brian Schlick, um, talking about high density EMG recordings. Okay, thanks for having me. Um, let's start the slideshow here. Uh, so quickly, I just want to acknowledge my co-authors on this, uh, Andrew Norton at Texas A&M and Dan Ferris at the University of Florida. So when you record EMG with a bipolar sensor, your result is one singular signal that represents the average muscle activity um, within the vicinity of that sensor. So there's, in general, poor spatial resolution from the entire muscle. If you use a high density EMG array, you gain a much greater spatial resolution because you can use a grid of microelectrodes and record uh, a far greater number of signals that represent the electrical activity, activity in a much smaller area of that muscle. Uh, and we know from stationary experiments that the amplitude across this array varies within the muscle. And so if you map these changes in amplitude across the muscle, you can understand which areas of the muscle are more active than others during a given activity. So in this study, we wanted to understand how different uh, lower limb muscles have um, different spatial activation patterns during walking and running. So we placed the high density EMG array on five major lower limb muscles, uh, the tibialis anterior, vastus medialis, biceps femoris, and medial and lateral gastrocnemii. And we had 11 healthy young adults uh, walk at two speeds, 1.2 and 1.6 meters per second and run at uh, four speeds, two, three, four, and five meters per second on a treadmill in our lab. And we analyzed the high density EMG spatial activation patterns during the phase of the gait cycle that each muscle is primarily active. Uh, and I'll walk you through each of those as we look at the results. Um, so let's jump into that just qualitatively first. Uh, so looking at the anterior muscles, uh, first we'll look at the vastus medialis, which we looked at during stance phase. Uh, and so what I'm showing here are the, uh, it's the spatial activation plot uh, and the orientation of each plot is the exact same way that this array here was placed on the muscle. So the top represents the proximal portion and the bottom is distal. Uh, values that are more orange or red represent higher EMG amplitudes. Uh, blue is lower EMG amplitudes. Uh, so just looking at vastus medialis going left to right at slower speeds, you can see that there's a more even distribution of EMG activity. And as speed increases, you see it more localized in the central and distal portions. Uh, for the tibialis anterior during swing phase, we found that there was more, uh, there was increased activation at the proximal portions of the array during slower speeds. Uh, and this shifted a bit as speed increased to the more central and distal portions of the array. Uh, and now for the posterior muscles, first biceps femoris during swing. Uh, once again, it's a little bit more of an evenly distributed pattern uh, at slower speeds, but you see it much more in the distal portion as running speed increases. Uh, the medial gastroc had a pretty consistent pattern throughout with increased activation at the distal portion. Uh, and similarly for the lateral gastroc, we also saw increased activation in the distal region. Uh, although there was, there was some increased activation in the proximal regions, especially at slower speeds. Um, so this is just a nice qualitative look at what these activation patterns look like. Um, to better quantify this, we use the measure of spatial EMG entropy. Uh, and this is a common measure used when trying to assess the heterogeneity in a spatial EMG, EMG activation pattern when using a high density array. Um, and the basics of it are that a higher entropy value represents a more evenly distributed activation pattern, so decreased heterogeneity, uh, and lower values are a more localized pattern, so increased heterogeneity. Uh, so I'll show each muscle here with a different color, as shown in the legend, uh, across all six of the locomotion speeds that we looked at. Uh, so we ran a two-way repeated measures in NOVA to assess differences among muscles and speeds. Among the muscles, we found significant differences in the biceps femoris, vastus medialis, and medial gastrocnemius muscles. And when looking at speeds, we found differences between the fastest speed, which was running at five meters per second, and our three slowest speeds, walking at 1.2 and 1.6, and running at two meters per second. So it's essentially stating that as speed increases, we tend to see a decrease in entropy, which means we're going from a more evenly distributed pattern to a more localized activation pattern in our muscles. So quick recap, we found that spatial EMG activity is heterogeneous across lower limb muscles. Again, uh, illustrated here, 
during running at five meters per second, you can see the differences among the five muscles we looked at. And EMG activity is heterogeneous across locomotion speeds when looking within each muscle. Um, best illustrated by the vastus medialis, very evenly distributed activation at lower speeds to a more localized pattern as speed increased. Thanks for your time. Nice, now we're gonna move on to um, Janneke Swagner in talking about in vivo Heinlein muscle during walking on hard and soft substrates. Take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, movement is a necessity for animals to find mates, uh, find food, or prevent becoming food. Most laboratory locomotion studies of animals concern locomotion over solid surfaces, which do not reflect complex environments and the variety of unsteady terrains animals experience in the wild. To investigate how muscles respond to environmental changes, we moved a little bit of this landscape to the lab, unfortunately without the breathtaking view. To elucidate how the facet lateralis, or VL, a knee extensor, and the lateral gastrocnemius, or LG, a main ankle extensor, adapt to an increase in mechanical demand, namely walking on sand, we combined kinematics, sonar micrometry, and EMG data. Firstly, I want to talk about the kinematics data. We obtained inner knee and angle angles from our white rats locomoting at 0.7 meters per second, as you can see in the graph on the left. During walking on sand, represented in the orange color, rats locomote with more extended knees, although going through the same range of motion compared to the solid condition in blue. Knee angles show more variation for both conditions, presented in the shaded areas which represent one standard deviation, compared to the angle angles. However, in the knee, there seems to be more variation in the stance phase, the shaded area on the right side of the graph, than in the swing phase when looking at the sand condition. The ankle angles do not show much variation when comparing conditions. And when walking on sand, the foot hits the ground earlier in the stride cycle, as represented by the vertical lines. When comparing muscle shortening patterns presented in relative strain patterns in the graph on the right here, we see a big difference in relative muscle strain in both muscles when comparing conditions. In the VL, the strain range decreased, whereas in the LG, the muscle strain range increased. Although the angle angle on the left does not show a difference in angles between conditions, there is a significant difference in LG strain patterns between conditions. This might be due to the biarticular nature of this muscle or the presence of a long tendon. Since there is a big change in muscle strain, we also expected changes in relative muscle recruitment patterns, here presented as relative EMG activity on the graph in the, on the right. Uh, for convenience, I just moved the muscle shortening data to the left. We can see on the right that both muscles are activated earlier in the stride cycle when walking on sand. However, the VL has a significantly higher activation magnitude when animals walk on sand versus hard, as depicted in the width of the bar. And as a summary, I present here the strain patterns of the stance phase, showing that during the stance phase, the VL undergoes more net lengthening presented in the white bars due to a decrease in shortening strain during the stand cycle when an animal walks on sand versus on a hard surface. Alternatively, the LG shows an increase in that shortening due to a decrease in lengthening and an increase in shortening during stands while an animal walks on a sandy surface. Together, these preliminary data suggest that rats accommodate for locomotion on soft sand by increasing muscle shortening by the LG and therefore increase its mechanical output and by less shortening in the VL. Further investigation by increasing sample size will provide more detailed insight in individual variation and muscle response robustness to how rats locomotion how rats accommodate changes in surface compliance and increase in mechanical demand. In addition, we will look into the role of the biarticular LG muscle as there is no direct link between LG muscle shortening patterns and the ankle angles.
Taken together, locomotion is a widely studied topic. Muscle responses to unsteady locomotion tasks, less so. Elucidating the roles muscles play in adapting to variation in surface uh, substrates provide a framework for assessing how animals meet changes in demand and mechanical outputs while moving through natural environments. It also sets the stage for future bio-inspired designs of dynamic robo robotic devices that are able to navigate through very complex and variable terrains. Thank you. Thank you, Janneke. Um, just moving on, the next talk is Daniel Kaufman, The Effects of Advanced Age and Walking Speed on Mechanical Functions of the Ankle Plantar Flexors. Okay, can everybody see me? Yep. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's now a well-established phenomenon that older adults walk with increased hip and decreased ankle joint mechanical output. And so I'm showing here uh, uh, some of the data that, that first uh, showed this. This is Drs. Davida and Hortobaji in the year 2000, showing that older adults walk with greater hip extensor power and lower ankle plantar flexor power. And notice the years here as I go through these, this is 2000, this is 2008, Amy Silder's work showing the same thing. And more recently, some of my uh, master's thesis showing the same thing. So this is a very well-established biomechanical phenomenon, and we are still trying to figure out why exactly this is occurring. We also know that uh, this distal to proximal redistribution uh, increases, the magnitude of it increases as you make the walking task more challenging. And so as you have individuals walk faster or walk uphill, they tend to show a disproportionate increase in hip relative to ankle. And we also don't quite understand why this is the case. Uh, some work from our lab recently showed that healthy younger adults, when they walk at faster speeds, increase the amount of positive work that they do at the ankle and decrease the amount of negative work that they do. So in other words, they act more like mechanical motors. And it's possible that age-associated uh, physiological changes to the ankle plantar flexors decrease the ability of their ankle plantar flexors to act as mechanical motors. And so the purpose of this study was quite simple. We just wanted to test whether that was the case. I hypothesized that as young adults speed up, they will show an increased motor-like behavior of the ankle plantar flexors to a larger extent than older adults. So we had 15 healthy young adults and eight healthy older adults walking at three different speeds on a split belt treadmill. So 0 0.8, 1 1.2, and 1.6 meters per second. We collected data for approximately 60 seconds. And then we did, uh, well, we did biomechanics, right? I think a lot of people are familiar with this technology. To quantify mechanical functions of the ankle plantar flexors, we used a, uh, an approach known as the functional indexing analysis. Uh, if, if I guess if we have more specific questions about this analysis, I can address those afterwards. But to keep this short, uh, this analysis basically uses joint level moments and powers to quantify the extent to which a joint acts as a strut, a spring, a motor, and a damper. Then I used a two-way repeated measures ANOVA. So I was looking for, uh, I was, what I was really looking for was uh, an interaction effect of age and speed on the motor index um, of the ankle plantar flexors. So here's the results. Uh, for the spring index, we, we did notice a significant interaction between age and speed. Um, but you can see overall, um, both groups tended to uh, show this inverted U pattern. This isn't a test of our primary hypothesis, but it is interesting to note this inverted U pattern with very high spring-like function at this intermediate speed. This may uh, partly explain, anyways, the lower metabolic costs at intermediate speeds that have been reported in both groups. So although not a test of our primary hypothesis, that is uh, one interesting observation from these data. The actual test of our hypothesis is here. This is the motor index, and we did find a significant interaction. So in the gray bars are younger adults, and in the green bars are older adults. And you can see that uh, both groups, while they increased motor index to walk at faster speeds, the younger adults did so to a greater extent, and this supports our hypothesis. So younger adults compared to older adults tend to increase motor-like function of the ankle plantar flexors to a greater extent as they speed up. Uh, we also showed a significant interaction for the damper index. However, you can see, uh, as you can see, as individuals sped up, uh, really both groups uh, reduced damper index basically to, to, uh, to zero. 
So there are uh, a few implications here. Advanced age is associated with reduced capacity to utilize the ankle pointer flexors as mechanical motors. An inability to utilize this muscle group as motors may limit the ability of older adults to walk at faster speeds. So although we controlled the speeds here, it's possible that this plays uh, some, um, some role in the reduced maximal speed that older adults can reach uh, when they self-select speeds. It might also limit their ability to perform other uh, tasks that require motor-like performance from these muscles like walking uphill or accelerating. And then uh, enhanced motor-like behavior of the ankle plantar flexors, whether it's through exercise or exoskeletons, may improve mobility in the aging population. And with that, I'd be uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And just remembering we're having questions at the end after one more talk. So um, the next one up is um, Jonas Yamarillo on our muscles tuned to the preferred, preferred stride frequency during walk. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> Thanks for the introduction. So whenever we walk at a preferred stride frequency, regardless of the speed that we walk, we minimize our metabolic cost of transport. And this is typically shown as a U-shaped response to changes in stride frequency, as you can see in the graph. It's important to mention that most of these studies or all these studies actually looked at whole body metabolic measurement. So unfortunately, this is not enough information for us to fully understand how or why is that we minimize our metabolic cost of transfer when we walk at the preferred stride frequency. The potential idea to try to better understand this behavior is to look at the um, individual muscle contribution to the total energy consumption of the body. And unfortunately, this type of analysis during dynamic activities like walking at different stride frequencies is very challenging to do. So that limits our understanding of individual muscle energy response during dynamic activities like walking at different stride frequencies. But most of us are very familiar with electromyography, and this is an interesting tool and really good tool to use during dynamic activities like walking because it provides an individual muscle response and is a non-invasive, easy to implement tool. Furthermore, there are studies, uh, previous studies that have shown a near linear relationship between muscle activation and energy consumption. In this case, is the global muscle activation, which was calculated by summing the lower limb muscle activations and the global, muscle, the global energy consumption. And there are the other studies that looked at individual muscle activation and then individual uh, energy consumption. In this case, the top graph is the individual muscle activation and the bottom graph is the individual muscle energetics. So with this information, we we use this uh, information to think that we could use EMG as an indirect marker to look at muscle energy consumption. So we were interested in changes in muscle activation during walking at different stride frequencies. And we have a few hypotheses. One was the individual, the global muscle activation, will have a U-shaped response to changes in stride frequency. And that the other one is that individual muscles will, will have a different uh, minimum activation at different um, try frequencies due to mechanical demands placed on muscles during walking, but that the global muscle activation will be minimized at the preferred stride frequency. So to test this hypothesis, we recruited 20 healthy young adults. They walk on a treadmill at the same speed, which was 1.3 meters per second, and they walk at their preferred stride frequency as well as two slower and two faster stride frequencies. And so we collected EMG signal from eight major muscles of the lower limb, and then we calculated the global muscle activation by summing over the individual muscle activations of these muscles that we collected. Then we created a linear envelope for every muscle that we uh, collected, and then we applied for different scaling methods. And lastly, we integrated the signal of the EMG over the individual uh, conditions, the different strike frequencies for every muscle and every subject. And so in agreement with our predictions, the individual and the global muscle activation had a U-shaped response to changes in stride frequency. And here I have uh, four muscles that show statistical significance uh, between the predicted minimum stride frequency and the preferred stride frequency. And in contrast, the global muscle activation showed no statistical significance between the predicted minimum activation stride frequency and the preferred stride frequency. <clears throat> 
Now, I, I'd like to mention that although I don't have the other four muscles here, the, the, both, the, the other four muscles had no statistical, statistical significance. So overall, in the individual muscle response, we have muscles that the predicted minimum activation straight frequency was found at below the preferred straight frequency, at the preferred straight frequency, and above the preferred straight frequency. So this uh, created a range that was 4% below to 8% above the preferred straight frequency. And so to conclude, the, we think one of the, the reasons why the metabolic cost of transfer is, is minimized at the preferred straight frequency is maybe in part because the global mass activation is actually minimized at the preferred straight frequency. And uh, an important uh, limitation in this study is that we actually did not calculate it or collect any muscle energetics. So um, if we look at the, the individual muscle response to changes in straight frequency, because they're different, that probably allows to widen the U-shaped curve of the metabolic cost of transport. So that allows for some flexibility in our walking. And so that way we maintain low energy cost. And lastly, we actually still do not fully understand if the human body directly minimizes the metabolic cost of transport or if it is a consequence of minimizing global muscle activation when walking at the preferred stride frequency. And with that, thank you. All right, thanks to all of our speakers in that, in the, that block. Uh, so we'll go straight into uh, questions. So the first question is for Brian, and this is actually from Jonas. He wanted to know if you have information about uh, what the participants' running patterns were in terms of pronation, supination, and then I'll add to that, does it, do you think that might affect that, so where, that, where that localization occurred? Yeah, I don't, um, off the top of my head, I don't have information about pronation, supination. Uh, we looked a little bit at foot strike patterns in terms of a forefoot versus a heel strike pattern. Um, and of the 11 subjects we tested, I believe only one subject ran with a, a forefoot strike. So I, you know, the um, influence on our results from that, I think would be pretty minimal. Um, so off the top of my head, no, I don't know about pronation, supination, although it, it definitely could uh, play a little bit of a role, uh, especially across the range of speeds, but I'd, I'd have to dig into that a little bit and look. Cool, and then another question, um, just more of a clarification is from Ben Schaefer. Uh, could the increased distal EMG for the gas rocks that you found be associated all with soleus EMG activity? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, so the electrode array, array that we use has uh, pretty small electrodes. I, I don't remember the exact number, but I want to say the diameter is around four millimeters and the inner electrode spacing is eight millimeters. So the depth and area that those can record is pretty small. So I doubt that it's getting deep enough to pick up um, any uh, level of soleus activity that would really mix the signals. Cool. Okay, so the next question is for Yannicka. Um, Giovanni Martino wanted, uh, made the following comment slash question. So you showed that the mean amplitude of, you showed differences about the mean amplitude of those muscles throughout each cycle. Uh, the question is, what about time? And did you see any differences in the activation sequence um, during different areas or time of, of the muscle? I'm not sure if I, if I really fully understand that question. Um, and because this is like a little bit of a different forum, uh, can I ask if that person puts it on Slack, so. then I will go there. Like, uh, okay. So here's the thing. So Giovanni, uh, this, this is the clarification. So yes. So when you ask a question, please make sure to clarify who you're asking the question for. So this was actually oh. for, so that would be why there's some confusion. That was actually for Brian. So, um, sorry. <laughs> Do you want me to take that real quick, Jessica? Uh, yeah, take that real quick. If you can do it in like 10 seconds or 15 seconds, sure. Yeah, the, the quick thing is that we've played around with um, looking at uh, activations across different time points, so especially for the gastrox, like pre-activation, breaking, propulsion. But um, I, anecdotally, I could talk about it. So I'm happy to discuss that during you know Slack chat later or something. Great. OK, so my question, though, for you, Yannicka, is um, what do you think the functional implications are for those differences that you found in the soft versus hard? And actually, what surfaces do these animals typically walk on? That's a very good question. That was one of the, the questions that I thought I would get here, because obviously these are lab rats. Um, it's what we 
I do not think like obviously these rats are live in cages, not in sandy deserts, right? Um, but I think it still um, can elucidate how muscles change if they walk over a different substrate. And in this, in this particular case, we choose for a sandy surface. Does that answer your question a little bit? It's just some yeah, people are time constrained. Yeah, we can maybe talk about it a little bit more as yeah. you're saying. I was also a little bit con con or wondering if like there's a, you know, make a, a you know, there, you talked at the beginning whether or not they're trying to not get eaten or stuff, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so the next question is for uh, uh, Daniel. Uh, this comes from Paul DeVita, who would like you to explain the strut function a little bit more and specifically what does strut mean in locomotion? Sure, so in this, uh, with the functional indexing analysis, the strut index is calculated such that if at a joint there's a high moment that coincides with a low amount of mechanical work, there will be a high strut-like function. So essentially a lot of force, not a lot of motion at the joint, uh, you'll get a high strut function. What that means for locomotion, uh, I guess it, it could mean a couple different things. It could mean that there is some kind of power transfer, like high power transfer through the, or energy transfer through the, uh, through the joint itself. Um, but I have so far not linked any of these, uh, any of these indices to anything like that. So a little bit more work has to be done on this. Uh, as far as I know, there's only been three papers or so that have used this analysis. Cool. I just have a really quick follow-up question to that then. Do you sure. think that uh, you would find similar differences in tasks other than locomotion? Uh, such as ho uh, hopping? Uh, sure. Hopping. Any other thing that we do on a day-to-day? -day? <laughs> uh, turning? <laughs> turning. Uh, yeah, it would be interesting. We, we are considering applying these, uh, these analyses to we haven't really considered applying them to anything like hopping, but we have some post-stroke data. And you can imagine that a paretic leg that doesn't have a lot of motion at the joints would probably act more like a strut. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure that if you were hopping, you would see probably higher spring-like function. Cool, so our next, uh, it's a question slash questions come for Jonas from both Jonas Rubinson and Greg Suwicki who had very similar questions. Uh, was related to how do you take into account different muscle sizes, uh, whether that's uh, your physiological cross-sectional area or muscle lengths, in order to scale the uh, contributions to overall global muscle activity cost? Uh, yeah, so I, I know uh, Jonas was more like, how did I account it right now? And I actually did uh, one of the four different scaling methods that I, I have was um, calculating muscle volume and then implement like a scale my muscle activations for each muscle volume. Um, there are um, equations that can cal easily calculate that. And, and, and then to, to Greg's wiki, I think that it will be also interesting to like use more information in terms of the muscle, like physiology and the cross-sectional area and, and things like that to see if, if that even further uh, changes our results or anything. Um, so yeah, great questions. All right, we probably have time for one more question. So I'm just gonna scroll through and see if anyone else had one. If not, I actually have a, a, a question. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to, this is more of a comment from Paul DeVita to uh, Daniel, who says that part of strut function could be the transfer of energy from proximal to distal muscles and ultimately to the foot. Uh, so this idea um, was from Bobbert and Chanel in literature on jumping. Uh, and so this might be a good uh, sort of jump off point for uh, mentioning that uh, we could have follow-up conversations both over Slack as well as in the spatial chat. And so uh, at the end of the session, I'll post in both the chat here as well as verbalize um, a meeting point in spatial chat rooms for anyone who would like to have offline face-to-face -face discussions at the end of this session. Um, in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and uh, move on to our next block of speakers. So our first speaker is uh, in this section is Alex Denton from the University of Michigan, who is going to be talking about the effects of varying tendon stiffness on the metabolic cost of walking. Hi, I'm Alex Denton, a PhD student at the University of Michigan in the Locomotion Laboratory. 
I'm presenting Effects of Varying Tendon Stiffness on the Metabolic Cost of Walking. Tendons are compliant structures which transfer muscle force to bone to produce movement, though tendon stiffness can affect the metabolic cost of muscle contraction during walking. The Achilles tendon stores and releases mechanical strain energy during the stance phase of walking through stretch shortening cycles. Changing the Achilles tendon stiffness can increase or decrease the metabolic cost of locomotion. The current literature focuses on the Achilles tendon due to its superficial and accessible nature. Yet, the effect of tendon stiffness across all of the major muscles of the lower limb on the energetics and kinematics of walking are unknown. The purpose of this study was to investigate the effects of tendon stiffness on the metabolic cost of transport and kinematics of walking to enhance the understanding of musculoskeletal function in locomotion. Based on data in the literature, we hypothesized tendons with stiffness reported experimentally. 5% tendon strain at peak isometric force will minimize the metabolic cost of transport. Our second hypothesis was joint range of motion will vary inversely with tendon stiffness. The second hypothesis was inspired by simulations of jumping that found jump height to increase with low tendon stiffness. We ran predictive simulations of a step of walking at 1.3 meters per second using direct collocation. Tendon strain 3 through 20 percent were tested across all 18 muscles in the model pictured to the right. Additionally, the metabolic cost of transport was predicted using a model of muscle energy consumption. The results showed Tendon stiffness affects the cost of transport and the kinematics of walking. This first figure shows the metabolic cost of transport over the range of tested tendon strain. The metabolic cost of transport was minimized at the stiffness corresponding to 7% tendon strain at F max, indicated by the blue arrow. The cost of transport gradually increased with tendon stiffness above 7%, but rapidly increased below. The figure on the right shows peak joint angles for the hip, knee, and ankle over the range of tested tendon strain. Over most of the tested range, lower limb tendon stiffness resulted in generally greater joint range of motion, with peak hip flexion in the blue box having the strongest correlation with decreased tendon stiffness. This next figure shows the distribution of metabolic energy consumption across lower limb muscle groups over the range of tested tendon strain. The overall trend in the metabolic cost of transport was driven mostly by the knee extensor muscles highlighted by the blue box with a minimum at 7% tendon strain. The metabolic contribution of the other muscle groups remained relatively constant. The results of this study indicate there is an interaction among tendon stiffness, metabolic cost of transport, and optimal movement patterns during walking. Tendon strain at 7% minimized the metabolic cost of transport, which differs slightly from the biological value observed in the literature. The metabolic cost of transport was most affected by the knee extensor muscles when bearing lower limb tendon strain. Additionally, peak hip flexion had the largest difference with decreased tendon strain. Optimizing the metabolic cost of transport and the gait kinematics of walking are dependent on tendon stiffness. The difference between the predicted and biological value from the literature may reflect trade-offs associated with task demands besides level walking at preferred speeds. Although much of the literature surrounding tendon stiffness is focused on the Achilles tendon, in this study, the knee extensors were primarily responsible for reducing the metabolic cost of transport at the optimal tendon stiffness. An enhanced understanding of the role tendon elasticity plays in the metabolic cost and kinematics of walking can provide insight into changes in tendon stiffness experienced during aging, injury, and disease. Thank you.
All right, thank you. Our next speaker will be Noah Piper from UNC and NC State talking to us about the metabolic and mechanical consequences of altered propulsive force generation during walking. All right, uh, hello everyone. Um, my name is Noah Pieper, and in this presentation, I will be discussing the metabolic and mechanical consequences of altered propulsive force generation during walking. Uh, to start, older adults consume oxygen faster than young adults during walking for reasons that are poorly understood. However, we do know that adults reduce their propulsive forces with age and develop a distal to proximal redistribution of leg muscle workload from the ankle to the hip. We suspect that the hip muscles with their longer fascicles and shorter tendons are less economical for walking than the plantar flexor muscles with juxtaposing properties. If this is true, a redistribution of workload from the ankle to the hip would be very costly for older adults. Fortunately, we also discovered that when younger adults independently reduce their propulsive forces with a biofeedback paradigm, they do so by redistributing their mus muscle workload and without changing their total work rate. This discovery shows that we can quantify the metabolic consequences of this redistribution in young adults in the absence of other age-related changes that may affect metabolism. Therefore, the purpose of our study was to quantify the metabolic and limb and joint level mechanical energy costs associated with modulating propulsive forces during the stance phase of walking in young adults. We first hypothesized that when walking with larger than normal propulsive forces, metabolic energy costs would increase in a manner explained by increases in total positive limb work during the stance phase. And conversely, we also hypothesized that total positive limb work would not increase when walking with smaller than normal propulsive forces and that metabolic energy costs would increase in a manner explained by the redistribution of muscles spanning from the ankle to the hip for power generation. For our experiment, 12 young adults targeted propulsive forces that ranged from negative 40% to positive 40% values of normal walking. During each trial, we collected propulsive forces, anatomical marker trajectories, and metabolic cost measurements. Then in post-processing, we integrated the joint power and moment curves and normalized by time to receive our joint work rate and impulse values. As we expected, the act of both increasing and decreasing propulsion caused an increase in metabolic costs. This makes sense as subjects are modulating their stride away from what is normal to them when they're targeting larger and smaller forces. Specifically, subjects increase their metabolic output by up to 47% when targeting higher propulsive forces and up to 58% when targeting smaller than normal propulsive forces. Moving forward, we created stack bar graphs to portray the workload of the muscle spanning each individual joint, as well as the overall lower limb workload during the stance phase. First, we saw that as subjects increased their propulsive forces, they also increased their overall lower limb work rate and lower limb angular impulse values over the stance phase of walking. This increase also correlated well with the increase in metabolic power. Therefore, we fully accepted our first hypothesis. Also, when subjects decreased their propulsion, they did so without increasing their total overall limb work rate or their overall lower limb angular impulse values over the stance phase of walking. Instead, the only level that consistently increased was their hip joint values, which was significantly correlated with the increase in metabolic power. These findings suggest that reduced propulsion influences the distal to proximal redistribution of leg muscle workload during the stance phase of walking, and then metabolic power increases as a result. Thus, we found that the distal proximal redistribution at least partially explains the increase in metabolic costs in adults during reduced propulsion. Um, before I conclude, I'd like to recognize that there are still some areas of research uh, in the study that we can investigate further. For example, our experimental setup is limited in its ability to quantify metabolic costs of each individual muscle in the lower limbs. And while it is difficult, difficult to quantify these metabolic costs exactly, we have the ability to compute estimates using musculoskeletal modeling. So currently we're using the data from this experiment in a bioenergetic bio model application to determine the muscles with the highest energy expenditure, as well as their respective phases of the gait cycle that require the most metabolic power from them. Uh, and if you're interested in the results of this study, I encourage you to view the work of my colleague, Ricky Pimentel, during his presentation at the three minute thesis competition at 1 p.m. today in the PhD session. Uh, the title of this presentation is called Muscle Metabolic Energy Costs While Modifying Propulsive Force Generation During Walking. And this concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening and feel free to reach out to me with any questions you may have. Thank you. So our next speaker is Talia Johnson from Penn State, who will be talking to us about uh, developmental plasticity of locomotor economy in an avian 
bipedal model. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Talaya Johnson, and I'm going into my second year of my master's at Penn State. And um, so I'll be presenting my research on developmental plasticity of locomotor economy and an avian bipedal model. So one of the hallmark features of animal locomotion is energy minimization. And a good example of this is on an evolutionary timescale is seen in, sorry, is seen in horses who have evolved to have really highly specialized limb structures and also um, spring-like tendon units that allow them to save energy. And on a more acute time scale, we can see examples in humans when they choose conditions that allow them to minimize their cost during gait. But less is known about the adaptations that occur in locomotor economy across an individual's growth span. So we want to know whether locomotor energetics adapts based on the conditions you experience during your lifetime. So that brings us to our hypothesis that a growing individual adapts to minimize costs specific to their environment. And of course, we kind of reach um, limitations and difficulties when um, conducting longitudinal studies in humans. So we adopted a animal model known as the guinea fowl, which allowed us to drastically change their limb loading history across their entire growth period. So starting at one week old, the birds were randomly assigned to either a control group or an experimental group. And for the experimental group, a lead weight was chronically added to their right distal limb as shown in the picture here. And um, the lead weight was about 3.5% of their body mass and it increased proportionally as they grew. So we adjusted those weights weekly. And um, over the 16 weeks of growth, we exercised both the groups um, three times a week. And I have a short video that illustrates um, this. So you can just see we herded them around the pen for about 30 minutes a day. And then um, at 16 weeks or skeletal maturity, we measured their walking, the walking metabolic cost of both groups. So we performed these measurements for, um, we performed these measurements in the both habitual, in both of their habitual conditions, which is either unloaded or loaded. And so addition to, in addition to that measurement, we added a, an equivalent 3.5% load to the controls and then measured their metabolic cost in that condition. So that really just allowed us to compare the cost of like the newly introduced load versus the cost with chronically carrying that load. And so first we found that the habitually loaded group that had grown up with this weight became much more economic at carrying that load. So here you can see that the unloaded group required much more energy to carry the load compared to the um, habitually loaded group. And in fact, when comparing the two groups, their walking metabolic rate actually differed by 35%. And so what was really interesting and kind of unexpected was the um, habitually loaded group actually required no additional energy to carry this enormous mass. And so we, um, when we compared, sorry, when we compared the um, habitually loaded and the habitually unloaded um, groups in their habitual conditions, remembering that one habitual condition is loaded and the other habitual condition is unloaded, there was actually no difference in their cost. So even with this increased limb mass, they walked no differently. And so this really suggested that the limb loaded animals had adapted to become more economical at carrying this mass and suggested that there was some morphological or even physiological change that occurred during um, their growth period. And so here we provided new evidence that local motor economy is indeed plastic across the growth period. And more broadly, um, our findings suggest that specifically increased functional demand during childhood may have large effects on the adult locomotor economy. And so our next steps are to really explore the morphology, mechanics, and neural aspects that are associated with these energetic adaptations. And so I would like to thank my principal investigator, Jonas, Rub Jonas Rubinson, and all my lab members for their contributions and support. Thank you.
Thank you. So we have one more speaker for this session. And while we're, uh, she's bringing up her, her uh, presentation, I just want to go ahead and remind people, and we'll post it again to the uh, chat, that there are two places that you can continue discussions on these talks. First is in the Slack channel, and the second is in the spatial chat. And indeed, uh, the National Biomechanics Day Lounge, location number one, is being designated for any post discussions on uh, this particular session. So head to National Biomechanics Day Lounge in the area labeled number one. All right, so our last um, speaker is Daisy Vega from University of Houston, who will be talking to us about reducing the metabolic cost of walking by using the arms to drive the legs. All right, thank you, Jessica. Um, can everybody see my screen? Looking good. Yes, you're good. You might okay. want to go to presentation mode. Yeah. All right, there you go. All right, so before I get into how we use the arms to drive the legs, I'd like to share with you our motivation for this study. So for individuals with a spinal cord injury, locomotor training is a common approach to help restore their walking ability. This provides the patients with body weight support and stepping assistance. Now, previously, it has been proposed that coordinating the arms with the stepping motion of the legs may be beneficial. As seen here, the patient's arms are being externally driven by a physical therapist. In order to investigate the potential neural effects from this coordination, Huang and Ferris carried out a study during recovery stepping. What they found was that actively using the arms as opposed to it being externally driven helped increase lower limb activation. So this suggests that the active use of the arms may be a key component to exploit neural coupling, but how we can translate this concept into locomotor training has remained elusive. So we came up with this research question. Well, first of all, is it even physically possible to use the arms to drive the legs during walking? In order to answer this question, we designed a pretty simple roll pulley system that connects the same sided limbs. We presumed that as the arm swung back, it would help assist the leg forward. And um, we rationalized that with this, there would be an increased arm demand, but the trade off would be a decrease in leg demand. So this led to our first hypothesis, a mechanical and neuromuscular shift would occur during the leg swing phase of walking. From a metabolic perspective, we felt that the same thing would occur. But if we're talking about the net effect here, then they would essentially cancel out. So this led to our second hypothesis, no change in net metabolic power would occur. So we recruited eight subjects and we collected metabolic, mechanical, muscular, and kinematic data when using this device. And we compared it to the control trial, which is normal walking. So they walked on the treadmill with nothing att attached. Uh, but for this presentation, I will only focus on these first three. So here we have our first figure. And what we found was that the arms generated an assistive force, as seen here in panel A, during the periods of propulsion and leg swing initiation, which is highlighted in light gray. This in turn caused changes to the horizontal ground reaction forces, but no changes to the vertical component. What was most profound was that this helped reduce the propulsive forces, specifically a 33% decrease in propulsive impulse occurred. So what happened at the muscular level? So here I have the EMG activity of the arm and leg muscles when using this device. And this has been normalized to the control trial, which is the normal walking. And the black horizontal line is the baseline, which is set at 100%. So anything above or below this line is in respect to normal walking. So I'd like to point your attention to here, like the arm muscles increased dramatically. And specifically, it was the triceps and biceps that were the primary arm muscles that contributed to the generation of this assistive force. At the same time, there was a decrease in the soleus and medial gastrocnemius. So this clearly shows a near muscular shift characterized by higher arm muscle activity and lesser leg muscle activity during the propulsive phase of walking. And lastly, we had our most unexpected finding. There was a 17% reduction in the net metabolic power. What was most striking was that every subject responded in the same way. They all had a reduction in their net metabolic power. So in summary, we found a neuromuscular and mechanical shift during the propulsive phase of walking. And this primarily explains the 17% reduction in net metabolic power. For the implications, uh, this method could be integrated with locomotor training to help facilitate the stepping motion of the legs. And this now paves the way to potentially um, explore the neural benefits via this concept of neural coupling. <laughs> 
All right, thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
in terms of when we exercised them. We didn't see any difference from their running, I mean, from their walking at least. We know that once we um, tried to run them on a treadmill, they actually had difficulties running with such a huge mass. So um, that was interesting. But with the walking and being exercised in the pen, we, we didn't see any difference between the controls and the experimenters. Great. Another one for Daisy from Trisha Xar. I can't pronounce that again. Um, very interesting study. This paradigm may also have an interaction between assistance provided by the pulley system and neural coupling. Do you think there's a way to parse these out? Um, and also, is there any way to make it portable for training? Um, as far as parsing them out, I would say that this was um be hard to or right we we want to find we don't have a way of uh, quantifying the neural coupling effect so that would be like the next step to see if it even influences or exploits this neural coupling and then as far as making it portable yes we have definitely <laughs> thought about that that would be uh something we would look into in the future for sure hey another one for noah from ashley rice are these changes reported as an average over stance phases or in terms of peaks? Um, all of the work rate and impulse data we had was um, calculated just over the average of the stance phase. It's like so rapid fire questions. Great, thank you. For, for Alex from Greg Swicky, um, awesome talk. Do all the tendons across the lower limb follow a constant strain at F max relationship? Um, I wonder how taking into account variability in distal versus proximal tendon compliance can influence your results. I believe they do have a constant strain. And then um, if it, I think it is likely that perhaps the optimal strain for each muscle in the distal and proximal limb um, would be different rather than all the same as tested in the study. And a follow up from Josh Baxter. Uh, nice study. Can you expand how you selected tendon slack length and if those values were held constant or varied based on preserving resting ankle angle? Oh, Alex, did you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. my internet's so bad. <laughs> it's okay. Do you want me to repeat that? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, from Josh Baxter, he asked, can you expand how on how you selected tendon slack length? And if those values were held constant or varied based on preserving the resting ankle angle? The tested range was selected um, partially based on what the model was capable of. So tendon strain below 3% was not was too stiff for the model. And then uh, moving upward in um, biological tendons, uh, you can observe up to 15% on the high end for some tendons. So we decided to push that even further and say, what if it's up to 20%? Um, let's see. Uh, there me, um, oh, for Daisy, did I? I don't think I asked this one yet. From Shabika Rafi, um, do, well, and someone else also asked well, how it affected the optimal, their optimal swing strategy and whether or not um, you think they optimize, well, just how, whether or not it, it altered the optimal swing strategy for the arms. Yes, it definitely did. Uh, what we found was that it increased the range of motion for the shoulder, uh, the elbow joint, and the ankle. So for the shoulder, when it was generating this assistive force, the shoulder was actually moving forward while the leg was going back. So like, there was hip, hip extension being facilitated also by the treadmill. So this just, the arm was trying to resist that pulling motion and that kind of just like built up this, this tension and just released it. So definitely changed the kinematics of the shoulder and elbow to produce this force. Thank you. Another one for Talea um, from Christian Jabowski. Very interesting work. Have you investigated the time course of this adaptation? How early or late can the weights be added to observe changes? Um, so we haven't really investigated the time course. We placed the weights on at one week and then um, we measured the uh, metabolic cost and did all the metabolic measurements at 16 weeks. So we didn't actually do any of the testing in between. So that would be interesting to see. Um, um, 
yeah, so I think we just had that at their skeletal maturity, which is uh, essential um, in comparison. That's kind of like a teenager for humans, but um, yeah, so I think that's all. Another question for Noah from Paul DeVita. Um, he says, I think I need a little more help in, in a basic explanation. How does the distal to proximal shift with aging explain results for both increased and decreased propulsive effort? Um, it, it mostly just explains the decrease. Um, so we, we hypothesize that just like increasing the work of all limbs will increase metabolic costs, which makes sense, increasing work and then metabolic costs will come up. But for decrease, we, um, we noticed that it didn't increase in total, uh, but there was an, only an increase in hip uh, work rate. So as you decrease propulsive forces, that increase in hip work rate only did correlate well with the increase in metabolic costs we saw as participants decrease their um, propulsive forces. And so we, we said, as you decrease, the, the redistribution explains at least partially the, met, the increase in metabolic costs. Great, that's all we have time for. Thank you for everyone. Remember the conversation continue in Slack. We will repost um, the link um, and in the spatial chat room. Thank you, nice job everyone.